Man, it is, uh, it is great to praise and worship the Lord. Amen. It is so good to have all of you here. And didn't Keith do a great job leading today? Give him a hand. I started to say it was like a blast to the past going back a year ago, but if it was just a year ago, none of y'all would have been in here. Amen. You'd have been watching us on television, but uh, it is good for him. He's done a great job, and he did a great job when, it was, uh, when he was filling in before Patrick and them came, but there, Patrick and Sadie and the kids are uh, out on the East Coast. They are enjoying the uh, ocean and uh, the beach, and so uh, we're glad they're getting some time off, but we're looking forward to getting them back next week, and uh, boy, I'd sure like to be swapping places with him at the end of the week, amen, that I could go to the beach and he could be back in Oklahoma. But I get to, uh, he gets to come home from the beach and I get to go to kids camp. Great fair change, amen. We are going to go to kids camp this next week and have a great time. Now normally this is the time for our kids that we dismiss to kids church, but today being the first Sunday, we're not going to do that, but uh, we'll be starting those again in, uh, next week and then we'll be covering uh, that for them for this point on. But they get to be in here with us today and uh, look forward to uh, keeping them in here on, on an occasion. I will mention very quickly, Jeremy wanted me to remind you, choir and anyone else that's in the choir, if you uh, are still in here, that uh, they will be having choir practice today at 4 o'clock. So just because Patrick's gone doesn't mean you get a Sunday off, amen? You got to work, come on, we got to keep this thing going. But no, that'll be 4 o'clock today, so still in the regular time. But it's exciting uh, to be preaching to you this morning. I'm going to be continuing on with the idea of... of uh, Connecting to serve in 2021. We've talked about the connection that we have with God. That is our primary connection. And that we are to serve Him. Then I've been covering the connection to the church. And how we are to be connected to the body. The serving through the body. Today what I want to do is I want to move over now to the third part of it. And that is to connect uh, to people. To connecting to people. Because might I share with you this thought. That my friends the church is in the people business. And it is imperative for the church to connect to people, not just to each other, but in here, but to people outside of the church to reach them for Jesus Christ. And we must understand that the church must be about people. So the title of my message today is People Business. We're in the people business. I want you to take your Bibles and turn, if you would, to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to be reading starting verse 35 through 38, and... Uh, be reading a very familiar passage of scripture, one that I've done sermons on before. So if you're keeping score, yes, I have used this text before. And what I mean by that, some of you know what I'm talking about, that they write down when the, the, the date that I preached that sermon on that scripture. And a lot of times I get reminded, preacher, you preached that sermon on June 17th, 1974. Well, first of all, I wasn't, I wasn't preaching then. I was barely in, in school, but uh, that's all right. But I have preached on this text before, so if you are keeping score, yes, but I promise you it is a different message because of the emphasis that I'm going to have today or that God has for me. Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 35, let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's word. You at home, please join us uh, reading the scripture as well. The Bible says in verse 35, then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out forth laborers into his harvest. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to sing praises to you this morning. And God, thank you for the sweet spirit that's been here uh, in both services. And Father, we pray that as we now step into this part of the service, that God, you would open our minds and hearts to your word, that God, you would use it to impact our lives. And I pray, Father, as always, that the words that I'm about to say will not be my words, but Lord, they'll be your words. I pray that the message is not my message, not one that I planned, but one, Father, that you gave to me to lay out for the hearts of the people. And Father, then I pray the response to be as you desire for it to be, and it's in the name of Jesus I ask these things. 
Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Folks, again, we must understand that we are in the people business. In order to be about the people's business, we must connect to people. Not that we've got to see them out there, but folks, listen to me. In order to do this, we have to connect to them. We have to go to them. We have to, we have to, to join in life with them. And so that's what I want to be looking at here today because we must go to give them the message. The message is Jesus Christ, amen? Now, Jesus' methods embodied the message. In other words, what he did matched what he said. So, in other words, then we as the church need to make sure that that which we are doing matches what we're saying, and what we're saying matches what we're doing. It's got to embody this. It's got to embody the gospel. So, what I want to do, look at today, is what is it going to take to connect to people? Well, the first thing is to join together, and I want to mention very quickly about our summer connect groups that are starting tonight. That in your bulletin, there is a brochure of all the connect groups that we have starting on Sunday nights, and then there'll be some on Wednesday nights, some throughout the week. We encourage you to get connected. We encourage you to find one of those groups, contact the facilitator, and then join in to get connected to people. This is, again, one of the steps that we're going to have to make First Baptist West a church that is working and a church that is literally changing lives, and that is for us to connect. So please look through those and, and contact the facilitator, and we want to encourage you to be a part of one of our connect groups uh, all summer long, starting tonight. Some will begin on tonight, some will be Wednesday night, some will be on throughout the week uh, during the days, and some even in the evening. So just check those and, and find out when would be a good one for you. But today what I want us to look at is I want us to look at how do we connect people. Well, first of all, very simply, we must have compassion. The church must have compassion. In order to connect, we must have compassion for the world. And now, this idea of compassion, because we read in this text, the Bible said that Jesus was moved with compassion. Now, a lot of times in the church, because we're a loving church, we're a friendly church, we've got Christ, and it's, we want to say, well, pastor, we are a compassionate people. We have compassion on people. Well, listen, can I tell you that it's not as simple as you and I think? Because this idea of compassion is a little different in our minds than what it was when the writers were talking about Jesus being moved with compassion. Because we've got to see that it's a little deeper than that. As a matter of fact, it was such a deep sense of compassion that we found out, and that we find out that in studying this word is, uh, is called splachnizomai. Splachnizomai is a word that means deep feeling. As a matter of fact, when the writers in Matthew, Mark, and Luke were writing about this, this word didn't even exist because they were, there wasn't something in the Greek language that would even remotely get to the point of compassion that these people sensed that Jesus was having. So splachnizumai is a word that basically means this. It's a word that means a feeling that comes from the innermost being. It's the pit of the stomach feeling. It's that gut-wrenching idea that something bad is, is happening or has happened or is going to happen. So the, the writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they made this word together so that it could really get to the understanding so when I say that sometimes we in the church like to say well we're compassionate people I don't think we get to the depths of the compassion that Jesus had when he had compassion with them it was that gut-wrenching feeling it was made, made if you will made him almost sick to his stomach when he would look out and see people and and he knew listen he knew that something bad was going to happen to them if they didn't receive him into their lives he looked out and he saw that and the bible says that he had such a gut-wrenching feeling for those folks because they were like sheep that had no shepherd and he said i i want the church if we're going to really connect to people we've got to develop in us that gut-wrenching feeling that makes us 
sick to the pits of our stomach when we think something bad is going to happen. Can I tell you, listen to me, wake up church for just a second. Can I tell you we need to be sick to our stomach about the world because can I tell you something bad is going to happen in that world? Something, something that should be breaking our hearts, something that's so bad that, that it again ought to make us sick to our stomach. Can I tell you that people without Jesus, that if they do not receive him into their lives, can I tell you they are going to die and be separated from him for an eternity in a place called hell. Okay, let me say that again. Do we truly understand that the people that do not know Jesus, that if they do not receive him into their lives, they are going to be separated from him for an eternity in a place called hell where the Bible says they're tormented daily with wailing and gnashing of teeth. So it ought to bother us, folks. It ought to break our hearts in here today to realize there are people that as sure as I'm standing here are lost. Can I tell you, the Bible tells us there's more lost people than there are saved people. The Bible says there's going to end in eternity more people separated from God than those that are going to be with Him. And if we're going to be connected, I mean truly connected, we got to have this compassion just like Jesus did. Because we see that Jesus was basically moved. The Bible says that he was moved with compassion. What made him have this compassionate spirit? What moved him to do what he did? What moved him to even go to the cross? What moved him? Well, the first was the lostness of people. The lostness of men. So when Jesus was looking out, and he said, and he saw the people. What he saw was not a lot of people who he was angry about that was full of sin and hated each other and, and that they were uh, doing things against him. They had no desire for him. They weren't worshiping him. They, they, he didn't see that. What he saw, my friends, was people who were going to go to hell. That's what he saw. And it, it ate at him. That's the compassion he had. It wasn't that he just felt bad for them. Man, it moved him because these folks were going to be lost forever. And it moved him to come and to go to the cross for that very reason. To keep them from going there. To give them an opportunity to avoid that. So he was moved by the lostness, but he's also moved by the need. He was moved to such a way because he looked out there and he saw a need that they had. He saw this, this longing that they had and that the needs of the people were there so desperately that they, they were not going to be able to have anything apart from him. And my friends, listen to me. We in the church, we need to understand that. I think sometimes we look out there and we feel bad for the people. We wish they would all be saved. We, we would like for them to, to change their lives. We would like for them to be different. But folks, does it really eat at us? Does it really bother us this is going to happen to them? In order to truly connect, it's got to. So Jesus was moved by the lostness of man. He was moved by the needs of the people. And the thing that we need to understand is Jesus' compassion always, always, always led him to action. He never looked out and he had compassion on somebody that he just went, oh, well, I hope it works out for them. I hope it goes well for them. I hope they turn around. As a matter of fact, every time we see in the Scripture that the Bible says and Jesus was moved with compassion, he took action. The Bible says here that he took action so much that every time he saw compassion, he would heal somebody. Every time he was moved with compassion, he would deliver somebody from their bondage. Every time he was moved with compassion, he would teach. Every time he was moved with compassion, he would provide food for the hungry. Every time he was moved with compassion, he would even provide money for their care. Every time that he was moved with compassion, he even went as far as to call people into service. That's why he said, 
Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. He said, look, there's a whole lot of people lost. There's a whole lot of people separated from me. So I have such a compassionate spirit for them. I'm going to call my church into service. Folks, listen, you and I as Christians, do you realize we're called to action? We're called to do something. We're called to meet people's needs. We're called to visit those who are lonely. We're, we're called to feed those that are hungry, to put clothes on those who need clothing, to give water to those who need a drink, to even give financially to those who are hurting and can't make it on their own. Do you realize God has called us to do that? And we won't do it, we can't do it, if we don't have that compassion. Can I tell you this very quickly, and I'm not going to get political, but can I tell you this? He never called the government to do that. He called the church. He called us. Because you know what I found out? We can do a whole lot better job at meeting people's needs than the government can. Because we're supposed to do it. As a compassionate heart, we're supposed to give to people. We're not supposed to be Force these people that say Jesus was a socialist. Are you kidding me? Jesus said, yeah, I'll give. But he said for you to give, not to the government to take it and to give. He said, give, compassion. If, we're, if we see somebody hungry, guess what we're supposed to do? Feed them. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. If they, if they need clothing, guess what? Give them clothes. You know why? Because I'm sure I haven't seen all y'all's closets. But if your closets are kind of like my closets, we got plenty. Husbands, not a good time to say amen to the preacher. But we're to be moved with that. Jesus was moved with compassion and he served them. All the while, though, listen to me. All the while, never losing sight of the reason that he was here on the earth. In other words, this idea came to me. Jesus was never too busy. He was never too focused to take time to make a difference in someone's life. Jesus was never too focused on what he was here to do that he didn't make a difference in somebody. Even if you'll remember the story that he was crowded about by a lot of people and he was walking through and and the disciples were trying to get people away from him and people were wanting to reach out and touch him and there was one lady that reached out and touched him and Jesus stopped. Now he had to get to where he was going but he stopped and he said, hey, somebody touched me. And he wanted to turn and he took time with her individually and there were other times he would hear people yelling his name and he would stop and he would walk over to them and he was never too preoccupied to not to walk over and make a difference in their lives my friends can I tell you the church we should not be so busy doing the church that we can't take time to actually help make people's lives different sometimes we can get so busy doing the church that we don't have time to volunteer or to help. But Jesus was never, never too focused on the cross that he didn't stop and help people. So when we look at this, we see the idea of compassion. To connect with people, we must have compassion for them. But the second thing that we must look at is compassion must lead out in our lives and ministries. Listen to me, compassion needs to be the reason we do everything we do in the church. Compassion needs to be the reason that we do everything we do as individual Christians. It is that compassion for somebody that stirs us up. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in what we're doing and we get so mixed up in the idea of of maybe a program. Our passion for people must never override our passion for a program. This is something that that I believe with all my heart. This is something that we talk about in staff meeting. This is something I talk about in all leadership meeting. This is everything that I've talked about ever since I was a teacher, ever since I was a, a, a coach and a pastor. Folks, listen to me. We cannot be so wrapped up in our program that we forget about the passion for people. 
And this is something, a quote that I'm about to put on here, something I've said so many times in my life, and I believe it with all my heart, about the idea of passion for a program over the passion for people. Here's what I believe with all my heart. Passion for a program may not ever produce a passion for people. Amen? You can do stuff. You, you can set up and establish a great program, but never once really be focused on people. But here's something else that I believe. But a passion for people will always produce a passion for your program. You know why? Because you care so much about people, you're going to do the best job with the program you can possibly do. Why? Because you have one serious motivation, and it is to change people's lives. It's not to build the greatest program. It's not just to have something for a checklist that we do. It is because we care so much about people, I'm going to make absolutely sure whatever we do works to reach people. But I can do, I can do programs all day long and not care one bit about the people that are around me. As a matter of fact, I can, get, I, can, I can care so much about my program, I get disgusted at the people around me. Because they're not following in. They're not coming and doing the program. And so we get so wrapped up in the program that we forget about people. And we get so locked into, this is how we do it. I've always done it this way. This is the way we're going to do it. But it's not working. If it's not reaching people, then we need to stop doing it. Amen? Now, here's something else that I share a lot with my staff, and I've shared a lot with other people. Years ago, whenever I was a, uh, a girls basketball coach, I, I, I had a certain style that I wanted to play. I wanted a certain program or a certain, if you will, game plan or a, a type of team that I always wanted. And I, I, it was one that was high pressure. Man, I loved fast breaking. I loved pressing people. I loved stealing balls and fast breaking. We'd, we'd run a play if we had to. But even our plays were meant to go fast and get in there and score and then get back or pressure up on defense. I always wanted to do that, and I longed to do it. And, man, that was every year I tried to do that. But what would happen is, unlike in college and, and professionals, I didn't get to pick my players. Amen? Now, I know some schools that do pick their players, and that's against, that's against the rules, but they do it anyway. I didn't do it, but I, I, I didn't get to pick my players. So what would end up happening is I would get a group of ladies that would come into to my program, and guess what? They weren't built for speed and fast breaking and high pressure. Now, I could have done one. I could have said, you know what? I'm going to get it out of them. I don't care. This is my program, folks. You're going to run my program. We're going to fast break. We're going to pressure. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But you know what would end up happening? We'd have gotten the full beat out of us. And I tell you what, I, I, like, I liked winning. I liked my girls being successful. So what I would do as a coach was if my group of people did not come in and were not able to fit my program, guess what I would do? I would change my program to fit the player. Because I wanted my players to do well. I wanted my teams to do well. I wanted them to be successful. Now, I could have said, I'm gonna, I care more about my program than I do my people. But it wouldn't have worked. And so sometimes I believe if we're not careful, even in the church, we get so program-ridden that that's all we care about. This is the program. This is what I want. But folks, listen, we've got to care about the people. And if it will reach the people, that's the program we need. That's what we need to be doing. So this idea of a passion for people must override our passion for a program. But let me close out with this thought right here. Our passion for people will come when and only when we have a passion for Christ. I've told you before, we started off this whole series of messages saying that the most important connection we're ever going to make is a connection to Jesus. Connect to God. And as much as I'm connected to God, listen, that's the compassion I'm going to have for people. You say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. I feel pretty connected to God, but I, you know, you're talking about that passion for people. Well, I don't know that I have that gut-wrenching feeling. Well, guess what? 
maybe if you don't have that gut-wrenching feeling for the people and the passion for people that are lost, maybe, let, let's think about this for a second. Maybe our connection up here isn't as much as what we thought it was. Now, am I saying that you're lost? No. You can still be saved, but not truly be connected like we've been talking about. Because I'm telling you, the closer we get to God, the more connection I have with Him, then I'm going to, I'm going to have a passion for the people. I'm going to have a compassion for the people like Jesus had a compassion for them. And, and the church needs to have a compassion for people. That's how we're going to reach people for Jesus. Because when we look out in the world, you know what we ought to see? We ought to see people that are dying, separated from God. And unless we do something, they may stay lost. Because God has called us to do it. So church, we need to be connecting to people. We need to be having a compassion for people. We need to be having a desire for people to come to Jesus. And when we do that, then whatever programs we run at the church will be geared for that purpose. And we, if it's not, then we will change it up. Uh-oh. Change up in a Baptist church. That's going to take some effort, amen? But not if we have a passion for people. Because we're going to begin to look and see, is what I'm doing drawing people to Jesus? And if the answer is no, but you say, well, I'm going to keep going with it anyways, then guess what, folks? We've messed up. We don't have that compassion. I told you at the first of the sermon that to have compassion on people, it sounded easy. To have empathy for them is easy. To feel bad for them is easy. To have a compassion for them, that's a whole different ballgame. Jesus did far more and just feel bad for those folks. He said, I hurt so much for them. I hurt so much for them. I'm going to give myself to them. I'm going to give myself for them. I'm going to hang on the cross so that they will have a shepherd. I'm going to give my life so that they can have hope. And he did. And now he's calling us. Pray therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers. You know what, the, you know what that labor was? The laborers are those who have the same compassion for people that I have for them. So it's far again. I think so often we, we, we take this and we make lighthearted of this, of what he means here. He didn't just say go out and do something. He said, I want you to pray that God would send forth those people who have the same compassion for the loss that I have. Because he said, there's a lot of people who want to do little things. But there's not a whole lot of people that want to do a lot of things. He said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth laborers. Why? Because there's a whole lot of people out there. And there's very few people going out to get them. Folks, we need to be going to get them. The way we get them is if we first have a compassionate spirit toward them. We have a compassionate spirit toward them first by being connected to God through Jesus Christ and him working through us. Giving us that sensitive spirit to folks. And when the church can have this, I promise you, it's going to be making a difference in people's lives. That's what my desire is for this church. Not to be the biggest church. I've said this many times. I don't desire that we have the biggest church. I don't care about that. But what I'd like to do is we have a very effective church. We have a church that's making a difference in Lawton. And you know where it starts? Right here. This is where it starts. By us connecting to him, then we connect to the body, and then we connect to people. 
I'd like you to bow your head as we get ready to step into this invitation time this morning. Keith is going to come and he's going to sing a song for us. And in this song, man, it just is going to describe what is needing to be taking place in us. So if you're here this morning and as, you, as, you, as we're going to just sit and meditate on, on, on what he's singing, and even you at home, listen to what, listen to these words, listen to God's spirit speak to you. And if, if, if there's something in you that cries out, God, I need you, would you call upon his name? I'll be down front, ready to receive you and uh, to, to pray with you, to, to encourage you. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but man, this passion you're talking about, this compassion for people, man, I, I, I've lost it somewhere. I've gotten so wrapped up in the things of this world that, Lord, I, I, I need to reconnect. And would you come this morning? I want to pray with you. Would you just call out, God, forgive me for losing that compassion. Let me join back with you again. And, Father, feed that compassion through me that I may hurt for those who are lost, that I may hurt for those who are needing help, that I may hurt for those who are scattered as people with no shepherd. Father, work in me. And as you work in me, then, Lord, work through our church that we can be that church that has a compassionate spirit, willing to do whatever it takes to meet people where they are, to lead them to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Father, start here with me now. Start here. My friends, I'm going to be praying for you during this song if God's speaking to your heart would you come you at home would you call the offices someone will be there to visit with you but let it start here connecting to people start right now in the name of Jesus Father hear our prayers in Jesus name Amen as you listen to what Keith's going to sing